Good once well, once again welcome for convening Lee on stage. As you can see, he's going to talk about the, the web everywhere. And if you look at his table up here, you can see all the goodies he has in, in stock for us to, to take a look at. So, Hukan, the Perfect. floor is here. We're very much looking forward to what you have to share. Give Hukan a hand. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here again. Um, Opera Software, we're based in Oslo, Norway, so we're not too far. And it's great to have a venue where we can come and meet fellow Scandinavian as well as others. Um, sometimes I wish I could speak Norwegian, but um, I'm going to continue in English still. So my talk is called The Web Everywhere. Um, I think it's been a fantastic year for the web. And we're going to go through a few of the things that I think have been very important. And I'm going to showcase some of these devices as well, trying to get everything to work. But first, unfortunately, I had to start, start on a sad note. Because just as I'm speaking now, uh, my good friend Trun Ögrim um, is being put to rest in Oslo. He died a few days ago. I don't know how many of you know Trun. He was quite a character in Norway. Um, he was in the 70s and 80s. He was leading the Norwegian Communist Party. Um, and he was one of the few people who've, uh, who've met Mao and uh, had his picture taken about it. He was very profiled on the left, but he made a switch to the internet, when, when the internet came along and, and communism sort of faded away, he made a switch to, to become an internet journalist, an activist, and he was one of the people who supported David Ayun in his case, um, in the case uh, the Norwegian government uh, had against him. And uh, I met Ayun many years ago, sorry, I met uh, Trun many years ago um, on a talk when he was giving a talk. Um, so I wish he could have been here. He's not here. Um, he cannot reboot. He's had his final system crash, but uh, he will be remembered. So, in the last 10 months since I was here, 2nd of June last year, uh, some very important things have happened for the web. I concentrate on the technical matters. I'm an HTML guy, a CSS guy, and I'm going to do a, a technical presentation, but I'm sure you can see some of the political uh, implications of this as well. I think it's very important that the web remains a strong platform where things are happening. The web is the most open platform we have, and we need to take care of it. We need to evolve it forward. And that has happened in the HTML world. Uh, HTML5 is coming along. We have some news uh, from the CSS side. I'm going to showcase some, some things that we couldn't do uh, a year ago. We couldn't even do it a week ago. It's just been released. And uh, I'm going to talk about Opera running on all sorts of devices. Some of you have seen them up here. Some of you have seen the $100 laptop and touched it. A lot of people want to hold it, feel it, see how heavy it is. And you're welcome to come up here afterwards and do that. Buy it. No, I'm not sure about that. I'm not going to sell it. <laughs> HTML5 was a word we couldn't really use a, a year ago. Since then, uh, the two groups that have strategic interest in the development of HTML have been able to, to start the collaboration. The HTML um, working group within W3C has been started, and the What working group, which was started outside of W3C, have, have joined in, and we're now working together, and I think, think that's great. Uh, we need a new version of HTML that's based on HTML4, which most people still use, or some dialect of HTML4. And we need to evolve it. We need a real spec for this. And that's now being written. There's been a lot of debate on this. Um, are any of you of the, on the HTML working group mailing list? A few? Not too many. It's been a lot of noise there. Um, there's a lot of conflicts about, you know, what, what tag should we bring forward? What should we throw away? What things should we add new again? Uh, the debate is happening right now, so if you want to be, be part of that, uh, you can still join. It's unlike most other working groups in the W3C, this one is open for anyone to, to join for free. Um, normally, you had to be a member or, or an invited expert, but W3C decided, and I think it was the right decision, to open it up to, to allow anyone who have an interest uh, join. And I think there's now more than 400 people uh, on the list. So it's a bit chaotic at times, uh, but things are still happening. We have two very good editors, Ian Hickson and Dave Hyatt, and I'm sure uh, that they will continue, they will bring the spec forward so that we can 
perhaps next year, talk about a real uh, stable HTML5 uh, version. The theme here um, at this conference is, is human this year. So I'd like to say just a few words about uh, HTML versus XHTML, because I think there's a human aspect there that's sometimes uh, overlooked. Let me introduce you to this character. Um, when you search for draconian on, the, on, on Google and, 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 and go to the images, this is the first image I found at least. So this is a draconian. It's definitely not a, a human being. Um, draconian is a term that's been used with XML in the way that XML handles errors. Basically, XML says once you find an error, you had to stop doing anything useful. You can't continue to process the document. Um, and XHTML, which is based on XML, they, they took this along and they said, okay, here's a new language, XHTML. It's based on HTML, but we want to clean it up now. So we're going to make it so that if you do an error, you're out. If you're an author, you better make sure that your pages are correct. Otherwise, they're not going to be displayed. So what happened, nobody really is using XHTML because this, you know, you, you, your browsers must, must stop processing these documents. And that's not very human friendly. It's not friendly to the users, at least. Maybe the authors deserve it. They put out a lot of crap there. There's a lot of garbage on the web. Most of the pages, most of the tags are really abused. But still, you can't really stop displaying the web just because the page doesn't validate, I think. Uh, that's what the XML people tried in the 90s, and that's what the XHTML people have been continuing to do, uh, but it hasn't really worked. And I think it's um, worth comparing it to what, X what CSS does in terms of error handling. Because CSS has this concept of a forward compatible parsing, where if, if the parser finds something that it doesn't recognize, it will continue. There are rules in there to tell it exactly where to, to start parsing again, start trying to understand the style sheet uh, in case uh, it finds an error. So it doesn't, it doesn't define how to handle all the unknown stuff. There's still going to be unknown stuff that it doesn't know about, but it, it defines how to continue so it will recover from the error. And I think that's actually a strategy that works much better for the web. There are going to be errors on the web. We just had to deal with them, and we should deal with them in a consistent manner so that all browsers do more or less the same thing. And that's, that's one of the, the, the things in HTML5, where they strictly define how to do parsing. They don't say, one error, you're out. They say, how to recover, just like CSS has been doing um, for some years. So I think that's an important step to make the web authoring and using more friendly. So that's looking a little back. Now looking a little forward, um, one of the things we have been pushing uh, inside the What Working Group and the HTML Working Group is the video element. I think it's time to make video a first-class citizen of the web. We have all these users who go to applause. Yes? Yeah? Any more? Yeah? You like video? Okay, we'll do video. Uh, for example, the Nintendo Wii, where we put Opera, uh, they, Nintendo really wanted to have a way to do YouTube video, so we had to put it in the Flash Player, because that's, that's how one does video today on the web. Uh, I don't think that's ideal, though, using a, a proprietary format and the object tag, which is quite messy. Um, I think we should do video the right way, um, and the video element um, is one part of the solution. There are two problems to solve, though, um, and, and the video element, the syntax for this, is only the first part. This has been done now in the What Working Group, uh, in the HTML5 specification. If you go there, um, you will find the video element, and you will also find an audio element. There's been discussions back and forth what the attributes should be, what kind of JavaScript interfaces there should be, and why shouldn't we just use object instead? Um, I think there now is consensus that we should do a video element, because then we can do more useful things with it. When we know something is video, uh, we have a higher semantic understanding of what uh, the thing is. If it's just a generic object, we don't know whether it's video or sound or, or, or a game or something. Um, video, knowing that it's video is good. 
and having some kind of control to start, stop, pause, and fast forward. All these things we know from VCRs, we should also be able to do on the web through a JavaScript interface or some buttons for users to press. The second problem, though, is much harder to solve, and that's about what video format we choose. Um, and there's a lot of commercial interest in this field. If you look at the browser vendors, Microsoft, Apple, and you can count Adobe in there too, because they do the, the Apollo thing, um, they all have the uh, proprietary video platform that they're pushing. Um, so they're, not everyone is necessarily interested in finding a baseline video format that everyone can support. I think it's crucial that we find a video format which is uh, free to use, um, there may be patents, there's a lot of patents in video. I don't think we're going to avoid patent, but at least those patents should be licensed in a royalty-free fashion so that you don't have to pay to, to make your videos available in this format. And also browsers like Opera, we can't afford to pay $5 million to the MPEG licensing authorities per year to, to, um, to display MPEG4 video, for example. Uh, Wikipedia, uh, they have a lot of video clips there now. They can't afford to pay money either. So we need to find a free format. The web is based on free and open standards, and I don't think video should be an exception to that. We've done pretty good with text, images, um, and video is next. We need to get this right. So I think Ogthiora is a solution. I'm not sure if you know this, uh, you may have heard of Og Vorbis, which is a, a, an audio format, which is also um, free and open for everyone to use. Um, Theora is the video cousin of, of, of the Vorbis format. So what we've done at Opera, we put together an experimental build that uses um, a freely available Og Theora decoder, and we integrated it into Opera so that we can natively show video in Opera. So I'm going to try to do this right here. Um, this one, this build is available. Um, if you go to labs at opera.com, you will find this, this build. What I'm doing here now is starting the playback of, uh, of three AUG videos um, that are present on this page. So the page is very simple. It's basically a small HTML page with three video tags and a little bit of JavaScript in it. Um, and now, the, the browser is playing video back natively. The markup is clean. Um, the browser has full control of it. We don't have to go through a plugin. And we can take this into all the different devices where we take the Opera browser. That's a problem if you rely on plugins for a video, like the Flash plugin. It isn't necessarily available on the $100 laptop, for example. So Wikipedia have chosen Og Vorbis um, and other uh, important content vendors are also looking at it. So we're hoping to establish this as a common baseline format for video um, on the web. There, there are some tools, if you want to start playing with this, there are some tools to generate uh, uh, Ogtheora already on Linux, which I'm using. There's the FFmpeg2 Theora, and there are other tools on other platforms as well. The VLC media player, which is available on Windows and Linux at least, also can play, um, can play uh, Theora today. Maybe there are other alternatives too. For example, BBC is working on uh, Dirac, another, another open and free uh, video format, which is supposed to be more modern. We'll see how it goes. Um, it's, not, it's not quite ready yet. But in any case, I, I do have to underline the importance of getting, uh, getting video right and finding, finding a good format for it. Then I'd like to talk a little bit about CSS, cascading style sheets. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with it. Here's a very trivial example of CSS and how CSS can be used to, to describe how to render an HTML tag on a web page. And um, we've seen since um, around the year 2000, CSS has really been usable in browsers. Before then, there were too many differences, too many bugs, too many unimplemented features for anyone to really use it for real. 
but now with modern browsers, all modern browsers support CSS as one, basically. Uh, so you can do things like this, the CSS Zen Garden. This is the unstyled CSS Zen Garden page. And if you, if you add a, a style sheet, this is just a one line change between this quite boring presentation and, and, and this one. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Zen Garden where you can go as a designer and submit, submit a style sheet that styles this page. And it's quite incredible what people have been able to do with, uh, with style sheets uh, this way. Looking forward again, um, CSS3 has been in the work, uh, works for long. Um, CSS2 was done in 1998, so we basically used almost 10 years and CSS3 isn't nearly done yet. And a lot of people complain, why, why haven't you finished? Why, why does it take you so long? And the reason why it takes so long is that whenever you have something successful, a lot of people come, come running. So there's a lot of people now who want to do all sorts of things in CSS, like vertical text and... Um, and, and you know, when you mix Hebrew with uh, Mongolian in a Japanese uh, vertical setting, things like that that are very hard to describe. Uh, it's very hard to, to learn all about these writing systems. Um, so we have about 30 modules to do various things within CSS3. And it's, it's going to take a lot of time, and many of them are never going to be finished or, or implemented, I believe. But there are some very important things coming out um, and it has been suggested that we do um, a CSS 2.2 um, coming after CSS 2.1, which is pretty much done now. CSS 2.1 is basically cutting down CSS 2, the unused part of CSS 2, to create something that the, the authors can, can rely on. Um, and that's almost there. Um, then there are some, some things uh, that are working, something we can see coming, something that, that are easy to implement that, that we want to do. And I'm going to show some of, some of them here. Um, one of them is multi-column layout. This is not from a web browser. This picture here is from uh, Microsoft's New York, New York Times Reader, which was put out last year, which is a pretty good presentation, I think. They do a lot of things right here. They do multi-column layout. They do images um, that float in the paper, and they do downloadable fonts so that New York Times here uses the New York Times even on screen. They also use a page-based page presentation. It's not a scroll bar on the right. You go to the next page. So it's page up, page down, just like I do in my presentation here, instead of the, the, the brown metaphor of scroll bars. So I think we might want to do something similar uh, for the web. And fortunately, we've had this specification on multi-column layout for a while, and, and one browser, it's not Opera, it's uh, Mozilla, has implemented it. And here you can see um, an HTML page uh, in Mozilla where it changes. You see the change here? It's pretty cool, huh? So the, what, what it's happening here is that it sets, the, the page sets an uh, margin width. Um, and then, depending on how wide the window is, the browser will figure out how many margins there's, there are, there's room for. We can't, we can't quite do what, what um, Microsoft is doing here with spanning images yet. Here you see the, the, the image spans two columns, but that's also being, being worked on. So if we look at the CSS code behind it, it's quite simple, actually. We set um, on the body element or, or any div, for example, you basically set column width. We've chosen terms that should be fairly uh, intuitive. Uh, you can set the width. Here it's set to 14M. That's what happened. It happened in the example. We set an ideal width. But you can also, if you want, specify a certain a fixed number of columns if you want exactly three columns. Of course, on a small screen, that, that might get you into trouble. Um, you can also define the gap between columns, so that here's a, about a 1M gap between the two columns. That can be set to be wider or smaller, and you can also specify um, a rule, a vertical rule, to go uh, between them. So what we're trying to achieve here is to give uh, authors the ability to do simple um, newspaper style layouts without having to resort to table and other, and other tricks. 
Then going one step further again to do real printing. Can we do real printing in CSS? Um, I asked myself that um, a few years ago. That's when we were doing an update to a book Bert Boss and myself have been writing about CSS. And we wanted to, to find out whether CSS is really as good as we claimed it could be. We said, you know, this can be used for screens, this can be used for speech synthesizers, this can also be used for printing. So we decided to, to put the book out in HTML and CSS and see if there was, it was possible to, to, to use that as the authoring language. And ideally, we should be able to just write it in HTML, load it in the browser, and, and, and press print from the browser. It's not quite that simple. Uh, in order to get it out, uh, the whole production stream from HTML and CSS to PDF, which was our final form, we had to use another program um, called Prince. Prince has also be, been used to generate this, um, this demo page here. Um, and Prince is able to do these kinds of things that, that browsers don't do yet. Um, Prince will do headers and footers. Um, we can look at this. I'm going to show you actually the PDF document that's, that's used behind the scenes here. Um, so headers and footers, for example, are things that are put on the top of the page or at the bottom of the page. Here's the page number. Um, the page number goes on every page typically, um, but on some pages, on right pages, it's on the right side, and on left pages, it's on the left side. So you need to be able to express that you know, on the page, there should be a page counter at the bottom, and it should go on the left and the right, etc. Um, that's a challenge. Then there's a challenge of, uh, of um, footnotes. That's a typical uh, way of presenting printed documents. To have footnotes, they're actually quite complex to do. Um, they have a, a number, typically a number, but it could be a letter as well, or just any sign. Um, a marker in the text, and then the footnote itself is moved to the bottom of the page. So, and, and page, ba page, page based floats is another thing. Um, this image here, as you know, in HTML, you can, you can float things to the left or the right. On, in the paged media, you can also float to the top or the bottom of a page. So, there are new metaphors um, uh, coming in, and we've been working, we've been writing a spec for this, adding these new features to make sure that CSS can describe this. And uh, by using Prince, this special tool, which I cannot praise highly enough, um, it's quite incredible what it can do, we were able to, to do the book in HTML and CSS uh, only. I should also say, I had to say, I'm a member of the board of Prince, it's a commercial company. So, <laughs> don't take my word for it, but go try it out yourself. But it's great, really great to have an implementation that follow the, the, the specification quite closely, because that's been a problem with CSS1 and CSS2. There weren't ever a, a, an implementation, at least in the beginning, that was able to follow this. And when there's too much of a gap between the implementation and the specification, that's when things start to get unreliable. Just a little sample of how we do the headers and footers, for example. Um, we, can, we can set at the, top, uh, at the top of the page, if you want the title uh, element, the content of the title element, to go, go on the top of every page. Uh, we use uh, a new property called string set. So here we basically steal the content of the title element and put it into a string called header. Then we can refer to this string uh, later uh, in this at page construct. Um, it's a little cryptic, but, but not too hard to learn, really. Uh, you just set the content of this uh, top left corner should be uh, the string called header. Likewise, for page floats, it's quite easy to, to describe. Instead of saying float uh, left or right, you say float at the bottom of the page, or you can send it to the next page, or you can send it to the next page unless there is room on this page. So there's, there's a little bit of studying going on in order to make sure we can cover all the cases, or at least the most common cases that printers have been able to, to work out over the last uh, 500 years or so. Then there's cross-references, very interesting. 
on the web we use hyperlinks, right? We click on things and we, we go to the, the place. Um, in books you can't do that. Um, in books you typically have references. In the table of contacts, for example, you have a list of all the titles and then you have small leaders and then you have the page number. Um, and that page number, the author doesn't know the page number because he doesn't know what one, on what page that content will end up. That has, to be, that has to be generated in the formatting process, and if you change, change the font size, for example, the, the page numbers will, will change. So it has to be dynamic, and therefore uh, this C page 49 or whatever has to be expressed in a logical language, and, and, and this is the code we use uh, in CSS3 for doing, doing that. Again, it's a little cryptic, like target counter and two levels of percentages and things, uh, but we find that those who have tried it uh, learn it quite quickly, and we are able to do um, professional level qu printing with it, so that helps. Crop and cross marks, it's actually a funny story about this. Crop and cross marks, those are the, the things on the side here used to align the different prints so that the colors get right. Um, and I, I generated this PDF file and I wanted to print it out on paper and I was especially proud of the crop and cross marks that I wanted to show. But of course, when I got it back from the printer, he'd actually cut the page because that's what they're, they're, they're trained to do, right? So I never got to show them, but I can show them on, on screen here. Another thing that's really related to, to printing, but is also very usable on the screen, is, is web fonts. I've, I've been predicting that web fonts is going to be the next big thing for 10 years now. I've always said, next year you're going to see web fonts coming. And in the beginning, it didn't look too bad because both Microsoft and Netscape actually implemented support for web fonts in their browser. That means the browser goes out uh, and fetches uh, a font file from the web, just like it fetches images and text. We just make fonts another resource that the browser can handle. Now, Netscape and Microsoft, they chose their own proprietary formats at the time. There was no interoperability between the two, and there was no common tools to, to generate those font files. Uh, meanwhile, TrueType has established itself firmly as the um, format for fonts, I believe. And it's, it's open enough. It's not really an open standard, but there are good, good tools for it, and people seem to be happy with it. Um, they've certainly been happy with the, with the fonts we have on, on the web on our disposal today. These are 10 fonts that Microsoft developed around 1997. Let them out, let anyone use them, both on Windows, Linux, Mac, so that actually most content on the web today is, is displayed using these fonts still. And they're good, you know? They got great hinting, great shapes. I think they were great. But 10 fonts really isn't enough, and we use them for 10 years now. We we're a little sick and tired of Verdana, aren't we? Yeah? We want something else? Yeah? Good? <laughs> okay, now we're going to do it. We're going to do web fonts. Because the spec is there. This was in CSS2. Um, again, I'm going to show a little bit of code. Um, again, it's a little bit cryptic, but not too, too much. Basically, what this highlighted uh, code says is that the font family Goodfish uh, is to be found from a URL. So if, if um, the style sheets ask for an element to be, to be shown in Goodfish, it will go out and fetch that true type file, install it temporarily on the system, and use it to render uh, that page. I cannot show this in a browser yet. I would have loved to. But I can show it in the tool that I mentioned, um, Prince. So what I'm going to do here, actually, I'm going to show one more slide first. So what I've done here, I've, I've modified the code slightly. Instead of putting this at font face thing into the style sheet, I've actually put it into an external style sheet so that I put away all the font face um, declarations that tend to be quite long and quite boring, and I've just put them in a style sheet out there, and we know how to handle style sheets from the web. We, we know how to put style sheets out there, download them dynamically. Um, so that's where all the declarations are. Uh, and just with this, this one-liner, it's 
it's actually two lines because it's a long URL. Um, but this little piece of code will let me use these, um, these various uh, fonts in my style sheets. I've chosen to use Ray Larrabee's fonts. Um, Ray is a great font designer. He's put out lots and lots of, of free fonts for anyone to use. There's no restrictions. Um, it's great to have um, high quality fonts available to play with. So here are two of his fonts, Goodfish and Kimberly. And now I'm going to actually process one file. This was not possible a week ago, but Print 6 was released. I don't know if you can see that. What I did now is run Prints, which is a batch program. Um, it ran, and it went out and fetched the style sheet first. And then it uh, fetched the fonts, which is also found on the web. And now I can um, start, I can look at the PDF file. And you see here, this is the document that I, that I uh, formatted. And, and this is the font that has been fetched from the web live. Um, you're going to have to trust me on this. Uh, but you can also try it out for yourself by, by checking out uh, Prince, uh, Prince 6 and by uh, running some of these examples uh, for yourself. And I hope next time I speak, I hope there will be these pages will work just dynamically in, in browsers. I know there is at least one implementation in the works. So that's good news. Um, a short slide on, on microformats. I know uh, microformats were covered yesterday as well. Uh, when we did the book in HTML, we used we tried to use HTML tags semantically, but it's hard to it's hard to do it right all the time. So what we ended up doing is develop a, a small microformat on top of HTML so that you could put sections and uh, and and chapters and all these things. Uh, and we developed a small a small a set of class names for that, boom. I think it can be useful for others um, that do uh, books in HTML as well. Um, ACID2, ACID2 is a test suite. Um, as we try to have more browsers do more advanced stuff with CSS and PNG and HTML5 and all that, I think testing is going to be crucial. Uh, ACID2 was released two years ago. Um, this is the slide I showed last year. Uh, this is the correct rendering of the ACID2 test. Have you seen the ACID2 test? Um, it's a simple little face that's shown, but the test is actually quite complex. Uh, each pixel here in this image is, 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 uh, has some CSS or HTML code behind it. And the, the intent of the test is to make sure that browsers are pixel perfect when it comes to, to rendering um, this content. And if they are, then you will see the smiley face. If not, you will see something else. Um, last year, we had like four or five uh, implementation. Opera 9 was in beta. We hadn't shipped yet. This year, we have more. We have Opera, um, the Opera browser. We have Opera Mobile running on phones. We also have Firefox with us this year. That's great. It's Firefox 3, so it's not, not in what's, what's um, on your machines, perhaps, unless you do the nightly builds. Unfortunately, still, and this is very sad, IE7 is, uh, you know, we really try to work with them. We really try to help them along. <laughs> and we're going to continue to do it. We're not going to let them get away with that. They are going to support ACID2 one day. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about opera uh, and, and opera everywhere. Um, Basically, we have three kinds of units where we run Opera. One is the desktop, um, which is what I'm using here now. I use Opera to run my, my presentations. Um, this is actually a browser just in the presentation mode. It's a, it's a great little uh, thing that Opera has. Um, then we have Opera for mobile. That's uh, the phones. And we're shipping Opera in an increasing number of, 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 of mobile uh, phones. Then there's Opera for devices. Uh, you've seen the Nintendo Wii's around here. Uh, we have a stand out there with Opera running where you can try it. It's a surprisingly fast and clever little unit for browsing, I think. Um, 
and you can do YouTube. Sort of leaning back in the sofa it gives you a little different experience. You can actually share web surfing much more than you can on a desktop or, or even a laptop machine. You can do it to, uh, you can make it a family, family experience, uh, kind of. So these are some of the screenshots of Opera running on the, the, the Wii. The limited, um, the limited resolution is sometimes a problem, but we've developed some, some quite clever uh, zooming technologies to handle that. Also, we have, of course, ACID, uh, the ACID test uh, displaying on it. This is, of course, the cute little machine that um, many want to, to see here today, um, the $100 laptop. It's an incredible project. Uh, trying to make cheap machine, instead of making a faster, uh, more hard disk space, faster processor, they gone the other way. They created a machine as cheap as possible, but still a very usable unit. It has Wi-Fi, it has a great color screen actually, 200 DPI. It has a crappy keyboard, if you're, a, if you're a, an adult um, Westerner at least. Um, but it has, it doesn't have a, a screen output, so I can't use it for, to run my presentations. But it has USB slots. Uh, you can connect all sorts of other units, analog, audio. Um, it has speakers. It has a camera. Um, great, great machine. And we're happy to, to run Opera on it as well. Of course, testing the acid test. Um, I think, I hope this will change uh, the way the world accesses the web, and hopefully it can also be um, a sort of a stabilizer, making sure that we don't run too far ahead with web pages, that we still make sure we can display the web, uh, Wikipedia, all the great content that's out there. We had to make sure that it's uh, displayable on all sorts of units, including the $100 laptop. Opera widgets have had a tremendous year. We've had hundreds of widgets uh, being developed. I'm just going to showcase uh, a simple one. A widget is um, a small program. It's written in um, HTML, CSS, JavaScript, and the DOM. It's a, it's a little application. Um, you can think of it as a web page, but it, it doesn't live inside the browser. It, it can live on your desktop. You can put it wherever you want. And we're now working with others to make sure that there's um, a specification for these widgets. We don't want this to be a, an opera-only technology. Uh, we want widgets to survive, um, to, to get out there into all sorts of browsers. So we're working inside W3C for that. Um, if you're interested in, in widgets and, and web applications, you might have seen the Google Gears announcement yesterday, QL database in there. So this is something we're looking at if we, sh we should add to, to, to Opera at the moment. Finally, my slide is about Mini. Um, Opera Mini is a different kind of browser. It's not a browser running in the phone, although the phone is where you, you're using it. Uh, Opera Mini is a, it's about 100K Java, um, a Java program, and you download the Java program into your phone. And the Java program runs here, but the actual formatting of the page, um, all the rendering of HTML, CSS, etc., happens uh, in the server park, in the fixed network. So we have a bunch of machines sitting various places that listen to requests from all these phones, and we have 15 million users now, I think. Um, they're formatting these pages and they're sending over a compressed version. So, you know, you don't have to pay to send over huge images, for example, because we compress those images before we send them over. We compress the text. Um, it's just an incredible surfing experience. Also, it's much faster because there's much less information to send over. So if there's one thing I want you to remember from this uh, talk is the, the URL up there. Um, go try it on your phone. It's really, really cool. Um, this is Opera Mini 3, which is available now. If you're really into this stuff, uh, I'm sure a lot of people in here um, will want to see the next version. It's called Name Dimension. I cannot show it to you at the moment, uh, I'd love to. I have a beta running here, but they don't, they don't let me do it. Um, but it's coming soon, uh, and if you want to know about it, you can, you can learn about it from our pages. That's it for now. Thank you. Thank you, Elkan.
We don't have time for questions. But I'm sure Hogan will demo the $100 laptop and all the other web devices for you. We'll be back in, uh, in a couple of minutes with the next sessions.